little bit about Nick. Nick grew up here at Fellowship, and uh, he went through FSM, very involved, and then he went to the University of Arkansas, and then he became a student leader for Mosaic. And when my family and I and some other families from Fellowship went and planted a church out in Colorado, God put on Nick heart, Nick's heart to come out and encourage us with all those students every year for a week. And let me tell you, that was a big encouragement. So Nick, I just want to personally say thank you for that. And if you don't know Nick, he has the gift of encouragement. So he was a tremendous um, influence in, in our life. And also, if you don't know Nick, so Nick was kind of known for his long, flowing mm. red hair. Yeah. So Nick, what happened? You're kind of looking a little bit more like me these days, buddy. Yeah, it's going away quick. Yeah. There's no so, more long hair for me. So hey, let's give uh, Rogers uh, congregation welcome to Nick this morning Thanks. as he teaches us. Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Derek. Well, it is really sweet and really good to be back. I miss so many of my friends here on Sunday morning, and I'm, I'm so excited for this Rhythms series this summer and the opportunity that it affords us to really grow together. I don't know if you're like me. I find that I thrive in routine, and I also violently resist routine. Uh, everything in me uh, doesn't want to be... Uh, trapped in some kind of structure that, that holds me back. And so everything in me wants to stay up later than I should, sleep in later than I should. Everything in me wants to eat in a way that's not healthy for me, wants to, to cast off every routine I can, and I always do worse when I do that. We got junior high and high school students in the room. Where y'all at? Come on, let me see you. There you are. Hey. Okay, so I don't know about you, but this was my experience in junior high and high school, was that summer, everything in my life broke. Um, I had nine months where I was told where to be and when to be every single day. Uh, I went to this place that looked and felt remarkably like a prison. It was a big box bricked in building where adults stood like this in the hallways and pointed where I was to go and they hovered over me while I was fed food in a cafeteria. And when I got to the summer, I just wanted to cast off every structure I could. And it usually was some of the darkest times for me spiritually in the summer because I didn't have all of those routines and structures that actually helped me to live. And so what, what, we're, what we're finding in this series is that there are actually routines and habits that help us grow spiritually. Now, some of you might be inclined to really push back against that idea of a spiritual discipline because you've been exposed to a dead religion, a religion that says, here are the right things to do, do it in this step, and it has no love of God, no love of people in it. And so you want to kick back against the idea of routine and discipline in your faith. And I totally get that. I felt those feelings too. But there's a couple of problems with that approach. One, that idea goes against what Jesus himself modeled. Jesus who had an, inc I mean, the, the most perfect love of God that's ever been on earth had a regular routine and discipline to his life. It says that he would regularly get up early to go be alone with the Lord and pray. Uh, when it talks about them, them finding him in the Garden of Gethsemane, it was because he regularly went there to pray and be with the Lord. Jesus lived a life of routine. That, that idea of pushing back against routine so that we can have some kind of spontaneous, authentic relationship, that also doesn't actually mirror how real relationships work, do they? Can you imagine if in one of your loving relationships, you said, I'm only going to spend time with you or love you when I spontaneously feel like it? That would be a horribly selfish way to do relationships. Can you imagine if as a parent, I decided I was only going to feed my child when I spontaneously felt like feeding her? That I would remember to pick her up from school when I spontaneously felt like going and picking her up? I would, I would be in legal trouble if that's how I approached parenting, right? So in between two ditches, one being a lifeless legalism and the other being a kind of selfish approach that says I only do this when I spontaneously feel like it, in the middle is the commitment of loving relationship that says I'm going to keep showing up for you because I love you and care about you. And I'm going to commit to do that regularly so that we grow and so that I grow. So in our relationship with God, we want to commit, we will grow in our love for God when we commit to faithfully keep coming to him 
and establish a rhythm of doing so. So that's the goal of this series. Um, I encourage you, if you haven't gotten one of these books, get, get one. It's going to be a great guide through the summer. I want to tell you just a little bit about how it's laid out. Um, each week, uh, there's a, about a two-page devotional that lays out the discipline or the practice that we're looking at that week. We're gonna be looking at different practices for what you can do to regularly grow with God. And then there's gonna be a section called process. These are things to talk about with other people. So if you're doing this study as a community group, this will be kind of your discussion guide for a group. These are the things for you to talk about together as you process how to grow in this rhythm. And then there's a page that says practice. And that is a daily Um, guide for you to be in the scriptures growing and learning how this rhythm works. So our goal, the commitment that I'd love for all of us to make this summer is to grow together by jumping into these rhythms and choosing to make some faithful practices in our lives so we can grow in our relationship with the Lord. So this morning, we're going to talk about the rhythm and the discipline of prayer. So let me pray for us and we'll jump in. Lord, thank you for this chance to grow. Thank you that you desire to be with us every day that you faithfully always show up for us. So Lord, I pray that you'll grow us to show up to be with you, to choose rhythms of growth in our life uh, so that we can grow in our affection for you, our love for you, and that we'll be transformed. We love you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So when we approach the topic of prayer, I think it's ironic um, that uh, I don't pick the schedule for, for when I get assigned teachings, but it has been remarkable that the Lord has consistently assigned me the passages and the topics that I struggle with the most. Um, And so when I saw that I was assigned prayer, I just chuckled to myself because I am a thinker and a doer. So I want to study, I want to learn, and I want to make things happen. And I really struggle with prayer a lot. And it reminds me of a time several years ago when Mark Schatzman assigned me a topic that I was knew I was not qualified to teach on. And I asked him about it and he said, Nick, People get to hear from experts all the time. Every once in a while, they need to hear from someone who's really bad at something (laughs) so that they can grow in it. I said, oh, great. Well, now I know my role on the team. Thank you. So um, as we approach this topic of prayer, uh, since I don't have anything to tell you uh, from my experience, uh, we're going to look at Jesus and what Jesus has to say about prayer and how we grow in prayer. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 7, if you want to jump there with me. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. This is in a section that we call the Sermon on the Mount, uh, one of the largest chunks of Jesus' teaching uh, while he was on earth. And in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, Jesus says these words, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Okay, uh, this passage has tripped me up for a long time because it seems like Jesus is giving this blank check that if you just ask, he's going to give it to you every time. And I don't know what your prayer life looks like, but that has not been my experience. Uh, I remember trying to put this to work as a kid many times, um, and it was amazing all the things that I asked God for that never came through. Uh, and I, I, didn't, I, I couldn't understand, what do I do with this? Because I, I want to take Jesus at his word. When he says, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you'll find, knock and the door will be opened to you, how do I make sense of that promise given all the times that I have asked and it wasn't given to me? That I have sought and I didn't find? That I knocked and the door wasn't open. And it's typically the case the Lord teaches me through the spiritual wisdom and discernment of my wife. We were with our high school students last week um, at a retreat with them, and this passage came up, and she had this insight. She said, hey, this statement of Jesus happens in the middle of a conversation he's been having, and he's actually just finished talking to people about seeking and what to seek and how that fits with our needs in life. So rewind just a few verses to Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, and look at what Jesus says. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? 
Jump on down to verse 31, see how he concludes the thought. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek, there's our key word, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness And all these things will be given to you as well. Uh, What is Jesus saying here? Let me tell you what he's not saying. He's not saying that food and clothing don't matter. He's not teaching some kind of uh, twisted form of self-torture where you're supposed to just deny yourself everything that you need and starve yourself to death in seeking the kingdom. No, in fact, he says, yeah, God knows that you need food. God knows that you need clothing and shelter. So Jesus is not denying real worldly needs. He's saying, don't make your life about pursuing those things. Rather, make your life about pursuing the rule of God in your life. Pursuing God's reign, his will, his desire for your life. Chase after that with all that you have and trust your father to be a good father. I don't know if any of you ever had this experience. I remember my wife talked about having this experience a lot where she was always concerned about her parents' finances, whether she had a reason to or not. Was anybody else like that as a kid that you were like wondering, like, will, will we have the money to pay for what we need to do? And, and what her par- parents are always saying, that's not yours to worry about. We'll take care of that, right? Um, and it is as if Jesus is saying, hey, taking care of all the things in your life, dad's got that. Dad's got that taken care of. Your focus is to chase after him. That should be the focus of your life. If you will seek your father in heaven, you can trust him to take care of the things in your life. So it is in the context of Jesus setting the priority of how we approach God, what we are supposed to chase after, that he then says in chapter seven, verse seven, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will will be opened. Do you see how the context of Matthew chapter six really shapes the promise of Matthew chapter seven? The promise that whenever you seek, you are absolutely guaranteed to find, that whenever you ask, you will absolutely receive, is based on seeking rightly. It's based on the idea that what we should be seeking is knowing and loving God and having him shape and transform our lives. And we trust him to decide what needs we have in our lives. So many times people feel really broken and discouraged because something doesn't happen for them that they think God has promised that God never promised. So they really want the new job. And they ask God for the new job and they don't get the new job and they feel like God has failed them. God never promised the new job. What God promised is himself and a relationship with himself that will transform you and that he will make the right, the best choices for what you need in life. And that's, that's where Jesus goes next in verse nine. He addresses the underlying belief and conviction that can get in the way of prayer or will enable prayer and it has to do with trusting the heart of God. In verse nine, he says, which of you, If your son asks for bread, we'll give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. I mean, that's an absurd picture, but Jesus is intentionally trying to show us what a ridiculous idea that is. Like, if your child, if, if my child comes to me and says, I'm hungry, I don't go grab a rattlesnake and say, here, go play. No dad does that, right? And Jesus says, Your fathers know how to take care of kids. He says in verse 11, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? We now have this kind of sandwich approach to the command to ask and to seek. On the front end, we're told to focus on seeking God's kingdom. And on the back end, we're told to trust God to be the kind of father who gives good gifts. 
and sometimes this wise and good father doesn't give us the things that we ask for. As a parent, parents in the room, have you ever had to make the choice to not give your child the thing that they desperately want? We do it all the time, right? Because we as parents, in theory, know better than our kids. And Jesus is saying, if you are gonna have a relationship where you come to the Lord regularly, you're gonna have to trust that he's a good father who knows your needs and desires to give them to you. Now, my guess is there are probably some people in the room who just completely disconnected. They completely disengaged because they said, actually, I didn't have a father that I could trust to give me good things. I didn't have a father who, when I had a need, gave me what was best and didn't give me things that were harmful for me. So this teaching totally breaks down for you. I just wanna speak to that for a moment. Um, Many, many people have fathers who were abusive, neglectful, or completely absent. And and that can really do harm to our understanding of what God is like because we haven't had that picture of what a good father should be. And, and that's one of the reasons that, that being God-loving, honoring parents is such an important emphasis in the scriptures is the way parents love their children paints a picture for them of how God loves us. And so if you're one of those people who you're, you're going, I don't know what this picture of a good father looks like, um, I just wanna say you're welcome here. And one of the things we wanna do is begin to heal that picture of family and heal that picture of fatherhood in this place. Because, you know, I had a great dad. I have a great dad who loves me well and provided for me. But you know what I didn't have? I didn't have a perfect dad. Everyone in here had a variety of experiences of fatherhood growing up, but no one in here had a perfect father. No one in here has a perfect father, and no one in here is a perfect father. The point of what Jesus is saying is if there is a baseline standard of what we as humans, broken and flawed as we are, expect of parents, then our Father in heaven is so much more than that. And he will be for you what your earthly father was never able to be. And so part of healing is going to be learning to trust again. Because coming to God in prayer is going to depend on believing in his goodness and his generosity. The goodness and generosity of the father is the foundation for our pursuit of him in prayer. That's the reason that we sing songs about God's goodness all the time. That's the reason that we gather together to learn about the character of God is we need to learn what he is like. That's the reason we tell stories of God's faithfulness in people's lives is because we're learning to trust again. All of us have different stories of brokenness and hurt and broken trust and we are learning bit by bit with the Spirit's help to trust God again. Now, I don't know about you, but there's another side of prayer that is challenging for me. There's the, there's the theological side of trusting that the Father is good, but then there's just the distraction side. Um, I am a, an incredibly flighty, distracted human um, who can wander off really quickly. I cannot tell you the number of times that I have sat down to pray, and because I struggle with it, I will set the 15-minute timer on my phone, and I will set it away, aside and go, I'm going to talk to God for 15 minutes this morning. And I'm so ready to focus and be disciplined. And I will sit down and I'll begin to be very spiritual, talking to the Lord and praying to the Lord. And I'll really feel like I've exhausted my prayer abilities. I've given everything I have to give. And I'll reach over to grab the phone and see that four minutes and 34 seconds have gone by. And I will wonder what is wrong with me. So how, how do we grow in prayer when it's just hard? Let's be honest, it is not natural. It is not a natural thing to talk to somebody who you can't see in front of you, who you can't see them giving you some nonverbal expressions that they're listening. It is a new skill and a new practice. And an image for prayer that's been really helpful for me is the image of the treadmill. Now, um, 
you know, when I get on the treadmill and run for 30 minutes, let's be honest, I never get on the treadmill and run for 30 minutes. <laughs> but if I did, in this hypothetical dream world that we're talking about here, um, if I got on the treadmill and ran for 30 minutes, how ridiculous would it be if I got done running, stepped back and said, hey, I didn't get anywhere. I'm right where I started. This stupid thing doesn't work. Okay, that would be absurd. I would misunderstand the point, right? If I assume that I get on the treadmill so that I can go somewhere, I've missed the whole point of the treadmill. You don't get on a treadmill so that you get somewhere. You get on a treadmill so that you grow in endurance, so that you grow in health. Similarly, I often approach prayer expecting that something will happen when I pray expecting maybe that I'll see an instant answer to my prayer or oftentimes that I will be overwhelmed by a feeling of God's presence and love for me. That as I begin to pray, that I will suddenly have an encounter with the Lord and that will motivate more prayer. It's one of the reasons I give up on working out so often is because I work out for about five minutes and nothing's changed in me. I'm like, well, that didn't work, so I move on. Now, sometimes something amazing will happen while you're praying. Sometimes when you go to pray and spend time with the Lord, you will be struck with a sense of his love for you and his presence in your life. People I know who have deep and profound walks with the Lord can tell you stories about those experiences and they will often tell you that they are rare, that they are not the normal experience of walking with God. Solomon one of the kings of Israel, one of the most important figures in our faith's history, um, it, when it's describing his life, it's talking about all the things the Lord did, and it said, and the Lord even appeared to him twice. You ever have that picture that people in the Bible probably had God speaking out loud to them all the time? Solomon, the king of Israel, had his, this life of being used by the Lord. God spoke to him twice in his entire life. So expecting that something is going to happen while we pray is not the realistic expectation. It could, it could happen, and God sometimes chooses to do that. But if we enter prayer, assessing whether prayer worked based on if we had an experience, we're approaching it like the person who jumps on the treadmill expecting that they're gonna be five miles from where they started when they're done. Rather, we pray so we grow, so that we connect with the Lord and grow in him. Um, people in here remember Gary Harrell? He pastored this church for a very long time, and I had a season where he was doing some mentoring and coaching in my life, and I went to him, and my, my wife and I were, were struggling with something, and I went to him and, and said, hey, we're kind of stuck in this area in our marriage. Can you give me some insight? And Gary sat back in his chair and said, Nick, I remember when sweet Ann and I struggled with something similar. I'll stop doing the accent because you'll miss what I'm saying. <laughs> He said, I remember when, when my wife and I struggled with something very similar, and he, this was the advice he gave me. He taught me a prayer to pray, and he said, Nick, if you will pray this prayer every day, I bet after about 20 years, you'll see some real growth in your marriage. <laughs> I said, Gary, I don't need the 20-year solution. I need the 20-minute solution. And he said, Nick, that's not how growth works. He said, real deep problems don't change in 20 minutes. They change over decades of faithfulness. And that's the kind of relationship that the Lord is inviting us into in prayer. It's trusting that when we keep showing up day after day after day, that we'll begin to grow. We don't get in shape from one really intense workout. We get in shape from faithful, consistent exercise. And Paul told us that our goal is to train for godliness. Like someone exercises their body, that we grow spiritually through regular training and consistency. So how do we learn to do this? How do you actually learn to pray? Let me give you a few really important resources. And guess what? They all come from scripture. The first one is to read the Psalms. As somebody who's really analytical, for a long time, I had a hard time connecting with the Psalms. I wanted to jump straight to Romans and analyze theology, and I really struggled with what to do the Psalms. But the Psalms are first and foremost a prayer book. They are a book of prayers, and they will teach you how to pray. 
Reading through each psalm is a different kind of prayer. They will teach you how to praise God for what an amazing God he is. They'll teach you how to say thank you to God for what he's done. They will teach you how to cry out to God when you are in pain, and they will teach you how to tell God that you are angry with him and think he is running the world wrong. Can you believe that? That God in his wisdom and grace said, hey, there are gonna be some times that you think I'm really messing things up and you're really angry with me and you think I'm failing. I would love for you to tell me that and actually I'm gonna go ahead and give you a script for how to do it. What a humble God. That the sovereign, wise king of the universe said, hey, when you think I'm doing the wrong thing, when you think I'm blowing it, come tell me. He can handle our frustration and our anger He just wants us to bring it to him so that he can meet us in it. So pray the Psalms. Look at Paul's prayers, the missionary heart of Paul. When you read, almost every one of the letters Paul wrote includes a prayer in it. And you will see the priorities for how to pray by looking at at Paul's prayers. But the one that has been most helpful for me on a daily level is to learn from Jesus himself. His disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And he answered by giving them a prayer to pray. And we find that prayer in the Gospel of Matthew. And it says this in Matthew chapter six, verses nine to 13. Jesus says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed means for something to be sacred or treasured. So this is a request saying, Father, I pray that your name will be treasured. And then he goes on to say, let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, let what you want to have done on earth be done. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Because I am so easily distracted in prayer, I find that I need steps to walk through to help me pray. And so what, one of the things I do most often is I pray this prayer and use each line to launch me into my prayers for the day. So Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Father, help me to cherish you today. And Lord, I pray that your name will be cherished in my neighborhood. God, I pray that your name will be cherished in the world. In fact, hey, here's this one nation that I know we've sent somebody to reach where your name is not cherished. So I pray for that nation, that your name would be cherished in that nation. And Lord, let your will and your kingdom be done on earth. God, I pray that I would do your will today. Here's some of the things I'm gonna be facing today, Lord. Help me to to honor you and my choices. I pray that your will would be done in our nation, in my family, in our church. Uh, Lord, give me my daily bread. Lord, provide for my family's needs. Here are some things that my family's facing today, Lord. Would you you provide for us? I know you're a good father who wants to do so. And, And I start listing my needs there. Lord, forgive me of my sins and help me to forgive others. And I list the things that I need forgiveness for and I I pray through some ways people have hurt me that I need help offering forgiveness. And Lord, lead me not into temptation but deliver me from the evil one. One of the things I've found is when I walk into a tempting situation blind, I really struggle. But when I anticipate it beforehand and ask the Lord for help, I do so much better. So I'll take time here to think through my day and go, oh, this thing I'm doing at one o'clock, I know that there's a potential pitfall for me there. This is something that when I'm in that similar situation, I tend to struggle. So God, will you help me today? Help me as I walk into that situation to honor you well. Following this prayer has been so helpful in my own walk with the Lord. There's another side to to prayer, though. It's not just talking to the Lord. Tim Keller says it really well. He says, nonetheless, if prayer is to be a true conversation with God, it must regularly be preceded by listening to God's voice through meditation on the scripture. Meditation on the scripture is when we move beyond simply reading and understanding it to begin to think and reflect on it. C.S. Lewis said it this way, a man can't always be defending the truth. There must be a time to feed on it. This was one of the missing links in my own devotional time. I found so often that I would read the Bible, understand it, close the Bible, and then go start praying. And there was no connection between my Bible reading and my prayer time. 
And there's this missing link called meditation where we reflect on the scriptures and how they connect with our lives. Um, We're not gonna look at all the passages right now. David mentions this practice of meditation in the Psalms. Paul mentions it in Colossians. Meditation is not primarily some uh, weird form of mysticism. Meditation is reflecting on God's word. And so one of the simple ways that I have implemented meditation into my prayer life is, is I just ask three simple questions. Whenever I read the scripture, I try to summarize. I used to journal this out. Sometimes I just, I just think through these questions. What does God's word say? How do I summarize what I've read this morning? And then I ask, what's going on in my life? And I just kind of think back on the last day or week. What are some big things that are going on in my life that the scriptures might connect to? And what am I feeling about this? Do I feel angry? Do I feel scared? Do I feel excited? Do I feel regret? And I let those three questions of meditation springboard me into talking to the Lord about it. Uh, Here in a couple of weeks, we're gonna dedicate an entire Sunday to the discipline of being in the word of God. But I think it's important to see the word of God has to connect to our prayer time so that our prayers are being informed by what God has said. So in my devotional life, there's a process that I walk through that's just three steps. I do Bible reading, I do scripture meditation, and that launches me into responding to God in prayer. As we try to set rhythms up for how we're gonna grow with the Lord and grow in relationship, this process of having a regular conversation with God where we're letting him speak into our life through his word and we're speaking to him through prayer is essential to growing to be more like Jesus. A regular rhythm of God, of conversing with God through prayer and meditation will allow God's word to start to change and transform who we are. So our hope is through this series that we will not just have great conversations about rhythms and disciplines. That we'll not just go, mm, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Like all of the exercise plans that I've read and go, mm, that looks like a good one. <laughs> that we wanna actually step into these practices. So we're gonna do that right now. We're gonna set aside some time this morning to seek the Lord in prayer. The prayer team's actually gonna come forward. Do you know that we have a prayer team here to pray with you every Sunday morning? And they're gonna come forward and be at the front. If you would like somebody to pray with you, um, we invite you. That Coming forward does not mean you're raising your hand and saying, hey, I'm extra messed up. Um, we're all extra messed up, okay? Let's just get that out of the way. Coming forward is just an opportunity to have somebody pray with you. I also encourage you, one of the best things you can do is turn to someone near you and pray together. If you're here with a family member or a community group or a friend, turn to someone and say, hey, can we pray together about this? We're gonna sing some songs, and did you know that when we sing, that is prayer? Our songs are prayers to the Lord set to music. We're gonna have some time to sing, and we're gonna have some time when you can just talk to the Father. Maybe you recognize that that you have some distrust of the Father in your heart, some hurts that have caused you to not know if it's safe to come to him. Maybe right now is just the time to tell him where you are, where your heart is. So we're gonna take some time right now as a congregation to turn to the Lord in prayer and hopefully start a rhythm of seeking the Lord this summer together.